All right, it looks like we can go ahead and get started. Welcome to trade.io's group demo. Just so you know that you're in the right place, this is a live group demo and it happens every week on Thursday at 10 a.m. Pacific time. I'm your host, Sander Baltelar. I'm on the marketing team and I'm joined by my colleague, Stuart Frankie, who is a senior sales engineer here at trade.io. All right, awesome. So um, today we will briefly cover the automation market and where it's going. I will go over an introduction to the trade platform, which will be followed by an in-depth look at a specific use case. We will learn how you can automatically detect upsell opportunities. Last week, our use case was on automating a deal desk uh, and if you'd like to see that demo and others, you can head on over to our uh, YouTube channel where we post all of our uh, weekly demo videos. We're going to finish the session with a Q&A where we will answer any question you may have. So in today's demo, you'll see how we can detect upsell opportunities. In this particular case, we want to see if a customer is using the product heavily or is using a particular feature or is currently in an overage situation, that type of data is incredibly useful for the customer success team and the sales team. Uh, so we're gonna track events in segment, check Redshift or Snowflake, uh, but basically we can use any data warehouse uh, for product usage data and then send it to a CRM like Microsoft Dynamics and alert the right team in Slack. So that's, enough of me talking. I know that you're all eager to see what this looks like and how you can start creating this process uh, of detecting upsell opportunities. So let's jump into the trade platform with Stuart, who will be leading today's demo. All right. So what you're seeing in front of you is the trade dashboard uh, page here. This is what I would log in and see as a, as a user. Um, so you'll see here I have workflows that are listed. Uh, today, we'll come back to these two workflows for our use case today. But you'll see there's lots of other business processes that I've automated across uh, departments in my, in my business. You'll also see that um, you know, there are tags within each of these workflows, organization or personal. What that denotes are you know, the, the permissions or the sharing capability with that specific workflow. You'll notice there's a view up here for viewing all workflows, so personal or private and organization shared. I can look for my specific workflows that are again, private to me, my own user. Um, I can work on it alone, build out the business process, and then I can easily share that amongst my colleagues in Trey. So I can see those shared workflows here um, for my uh, demo organization, specifically um, across my, my colleagues and what we can collaborate on uh, there. So within each workflow, I can easily just change the sharing settings and, and switch that back to private if it's me. You can see who created it as well within um, each workflow um, and know who kind of authored the, the business process to begin with. You'll also notice on the left-hand side here in the authentications tab, another sharing capability around authentications. We find that you know, it's best practice to have an integration user uh, that is really used for um, you know, integrating or, or using with, with an a automation platform like Trey in that um, a lot of different users within the, the platform may use that same authentication. And so being able to share that across the different users in your organization is key. So you'll see in here, very similar concept as we saw with the workflows, the ability to have organization shared authentications as well as private just to me authentications. And I can easily change between um, sharing these either public or private as needed. So heading back over to the dashboard now, let's jump into our use case for today. Uh, the first one I wanna go over is what Sander talked about at the top here where we wanna look for segment data, um, segment events specifically, as those are triggered and as they occur within your application, you know, or your web page for that matter, uh, you know, kick off an event, send it over to Trey, and then we have a business process that kind of starts and is automated from there. So I'll click into that workflow that brings me into the workflow builder. So this is what I've pre-built today. Um, you know, what I essentially did here was basically grab all of the uh, connectors on the left-hand side here and just drag them over as needed. Um, you'll see at the top, the segment trigger is how we're kicking off this automation, how we start the workflow. 
If I click into that, over here on the right-hand side is my properties panel. So every step in the workflow is gonna have a configuration associated with it. For this um, case, we would be listening for events to, uh, on the segment application. So we could say, you know, any of those events that are pertinent to us within segment, we could say on user alias, on all messages is kind of a, um, a catch-all. We could look for a specific track event, et cetera. So as those occur, segment is gonna stream those over to us in real time. We can also get a little bit more granular around the, the allowed events that we wanna listen for, um, any specific users, um, as well as the types of events. So if it's identify, if it's track, if it's a page, um, I would just add or subtract these as I need um, for my specific use case. But once I enable it here on the bottom right, this is ready to go and it's gonna start listening for events in segment and we'll kick off um, executions, workflow executions from there. So a lot of times we're asked um, for this trigger, um, you know, what is the throughput, All right? So we have very robust infrastructure that's kind of backing this whole workflow in that um, some of our larger clients are using our segment trigger and sending potentially thousands of events per second uh, over to this single workflow, for example. So we'll be able to scale up with that seamlessly with our serverless architecture that we have in the background here. Um, so you're, you're all set to kind of scale up as you need, um, you know, and have spikes uh, as, as, as you have in demand. Um, from there, we have a branch uh, condition. So this is one of our core connectors. The core connectors are in yellow on the left-hand side. This is really used for building out the business logic uh, within the workflow, all right? So in this case, we wanna decide or make an evaluation on a specific event, the event type from our trigger over here. So the way I did this was basically dynamically point this value to test to um, my trigger above. And then we can make that decision as that event comes in from segment. So I wanna look for if it's an add user or if it's an overage, those are predefined events that I've configured in segment that I wanna be notified about. So I wanna you know, process add user differently than I wanna um, process overage. And I can easily add in branches here if I wanted to um, you know, add more events later. And I would just simply add branch, add in uh, more steps here as I want, or I could take it away as well. Um, from there, within our add user branch, we have our Snowflake connector. So you'll see in here that there is a service specific connector. As Sanders said, we have 400 pre-built connectors today that you'll have access to with any subscription of Prey. Um, at this point, we would authenticate with that specific service. And this would allow us access to that system. We would set that up there or use an existing one. Again, maybe someone in my organization already has an authentication and I can reuse that. And from there, we'd have access to their API to basically go through and perform any of the operations that we need within our Snowflake database, data warehouse. So we'll be able to create, read, update, and delete certain data or insert rows, et cetera. Um, for this particular use case, we wanna write a custom query. So we are able to say our warehouse we were connecting to, and then we can say in here what our query text would be. So we wanna grab our account ID, our features, our users, our tasks, um, and we wanna make the account ID dynamic based on the account that was sent over from segment. So I can do that is by dynamically pulling in, pointing back to the data in our segment trigger. And so we'll look at, we'll look at that concept in a couple of different contexts today. Um, the next step is to get the customer from our CRM. In this case, we're using Dynamics, but we have you know, dozens of connectors uh, pre-built for Salesforce or pipe, Pipeliner for um, uh, various other CRMs that you might have out there. So um, we'd be able to adapt to that, um, but the concept will stay the same. But we'll have in here the ability to get our customer to list entities or to list records or find records of my account type. And from here, I wanna pull in four fields. In this case, the name of the account, the account owner, the account type, and the tier of the account. The conditions below will be where the primary user ID on the account is equal to the user ID from segment. So it's again, going back, dynamically pointing to whatever came in in segment, want to kind of build the workflow around that specific event um, dynamically. So um, once that event occurs, hey, pull in the account associated with that user. So that'll return data from Dynamics. So above we have our input uh, to make the API call and then below we have our output. The output is gonna give us a sense of how this data is actually structured, what those fields are. Um, and we also have this um, dynamic. So when you actually authenticate with your uh, Dynamics instance or any CRM for that matter, or really any connector I should say, 
Um, this will become dynamic based on your specific instance. So for example, you have custom fields, um, you have custom data structures within your CRM, which a lot of users do. Um, we'll be able to adapt that. And it's easy for me to come back and say now, okay, this is specific to my instance and I can see exactly um, what, uh, what to expect. And that goes for other users as well as they come in here and start collaborating with you across your workflows. So our last step in this branch is to send a message. So we've now determined that you know, our event and segment is an overage. Um, you know, they've, the customer has gone past their usage. And so it's important to us to notify the right people on the account team so they can follow up with the customer and begin conversations around a potential upsell opportunity or cross sell, et cetera. So at this point, we'd be able to send our message in Slack. So above, just to take a look at what this, um, what this is, I have a Slack sandbox account, so I was able to use my organization-wide Slack authentication there. And um, another concept we want to highlight is our dynamic dropdown list. So across all of our uh, connectors, we're going to implement these dynamic dropdowns where I'm able to, as a user, click into this field and see dynamically what are the options for that specific value. So in this case, it's a channel. So in Slack, it's either an individual direct message or it's a channel. So you'll see in here that we have individuals, we have channels, and I can easily refresh this and get the latest data um, as I need uh, to see who to send this to. So it might make more sense to send this to maybe a general channel, maybe upsell HQ, or we could also make this dynamic based on the account owner before to say, who owns the account? Well, send it to that individual and have them follow up. So either one is possible. And then below we'll have our attachment. So what an attachment in Slack is basically just a nice predefined template for us to populate uh, data in dynamically from, um, in this case, account name, account type, things that we pulled back from our dynamics connector. You're seeing that it's referencing that data back from this connector. Right, so we're, we're building out this workflow step by step and we're using output from each connector as input into subsequent steps, right? really making this workflow dynamic. So at this point, um, we can add in all the fields that we want to really make this contextual for the account team to know exactly what um, the account is, is over on, um, who to contact, what tier they're on, giving them the right message at the right time so they can follow up uh, as needed. Another thing that's cool is we can add an action to Slack as well. So within this part of the uh, send message uh, operation, we're able to say, you know, what our button or our menu item um, would be. In this case, we say, hey, can you acknowledge that you received this message? Um, we could also say uh, things like, um, you know, potentially follow up or remind me later um, about this particular uh, event. And so we just make this whatever business requirements you'd like for your account team to be able to interact with the message in Slack as soon as they receive it. In this case, say acknowledge, we can click a button. We can also make this a menu item though. So there might be several options that we want to allow the account team to perform at that point. So those are all uh, available to, um, to you for uh, approval, for uh, notifications, for action items within Slack. Great. So our next branch here before is, you before yeah, go you ahead, uh, go into that other branch, I just want to remind everyone that if you have any questions um, about this workflow, just go ahead and um, add them in the Q and A box. Uh, we will get to them. So if you if you think of a question regarding this workflow about the use case or maybe about some other workflow, please go ahead and and use the Q and A box. I already see some people asking questions. So just wanted to remind the audience that uh, you can ask us anything. Awesome. Yeah, and I'll, I'll glance over this one because I do want to get to one more use case uh, in the time we have today. And I also want to leave uh, uh, time for questions. So thanks for reminding me, Andrew. Um, so within our overage uh, branch, right, uh, maybe we determine that we want to go to Redshift, right? Another data warehouse, maybe stored another part of the company. Um, so let's run a query, very similar query here for Redshift. In our other workflow, we're going to show what um, writing a query would look like without knowing SQL as well. So stay tuned for that. Um, the next step, very similar. We're going to get our customer record from our CRM. Again, this could be Salesforce, it could be Dynamics, uh, any of your other CRMs. It's going to work very similarly conceptually. We want to get that uh, condition to be the primary user ID on the account. And then in this case, we're going to send an email. So maybe a, a user prefers to be sent an email versus sent a Slack message. So we can uh, have that set up for our Gmail connector as well. I do want to point out that we have a uh, generic send email step in our core connectors. 
which does not require authentication. So you're able to just use our email server to just send um, a notification um, you know, free of charge as you see within your, within your workflow. Great, so uh, let's jump over to another use case kind of around this concept of upsell detection. So I'm gonna click back out on the top right there to come back to my, uh, my screen. I could say, well, uh, I wanna modify by a certain, um, you know, cause I just modified this, I know. So I wanna actually sort by descending so I can see this is the one I was just working on. Let's click into that. And it'll bring me into our other use case here we wanted to talk about today, which is more of a scheduled process. So a lot of customers of ours will, um, instead of having an event base, which is um, totally uh, you know, valid, we could, all, we could have this pulled or, or scheduled to run daily, maybe even hourly or more often than that even, um, to go and grab all the data that is of certain conditions. So we wanna say, hey, if there's an overage um, in the last day, let's grab all those relevant records and let's make the determinations on if we wanna go and notify the account team or what actions we wanna take within the workflow. So at this point, um, we have our scheduled trigger here. So another type of, of trigger, this is a standard trigger that's not specific to a service like we saw with segment. In this case, we can just run it every day, every month on a given interval. So we could run this as often as every minute if we wanted to, but probably would probably want to this every day, maybe every weekday perhaps. And when I enable it here on the bottom right, um, every time uh, that uh, duration elapses, we'll go through our workflow. So the first step is getting the last time we ran this workflow. We have a default value in here um, set to maybe when we wanna start looking back. We have a look back window of a certain amount of time. I wanna go through perhaps all of history, but we certainly could. Um, and the way, if we did wanna go through all of our records, uh, we could architect this in a way that we could actually just loop through everything. So in this case, we wanna say loop forever until a certain condition is met, in which case, break the loop and stop the workflow. That condition in this case is gonna be when there are no more records in Redshift or Snowflake for that matter. So once we've determined that we've gone through our whole database or however many records we need, let's break out of our workflow and stop the execution. That's what that's used for. And then our offset is important to say, um, you know, every time I loop through this, um, this record set, um, I wanna get a batch of a thousand records. So every time we do 1,000, then we'll do 2,000 you know, 2, to 3,000, 3,000 to 4,000, et cetera. So we can kind of set up our pages as needed there. And then looking at Redshift, we'll take a look at what a query looks like to uh, a not, maybe a non-SQL um, user, right? So someone that doesn't know SQL, very easy for me to come in here and use a find rows operation instead. So it works the same way, or say the table that we want to uh, grab data from, in this case, it's product usage. Um, and then the fields that we want to bring back. So all of these are using what are called our dynamic drop-down lists, what we, what we talked about before with Slack, where I'm able to, as a user, not have to go back to my database administrator and ask what that database object name is. I just click into this, it's going to pull my instance and bring back all of my tables. Um, I have my own uh, setup, which is pretty, uh, there's not much data in there. So let's just see that work in action. So there's our table there, um, but let's keep that product users for now and then all the fields will become dynamic as well. The conditions where a where clause for the SQL writers there would be our percent capacity is greater than maybe 100%, our usage is greater than 100, and then our date modified is greater than our value up here. All right, making this dynamic every time we run it, let's get the date modified um, data that's only relevant to this run. So um, next step is to see if there are more records um, you know, that we need to process through. Uh, if there are, we loop through those, those rows one by one. Um, you know, and so we could potentially do this in batches, but uh, for today, we're just looking at kind of row by row. And similar to how we saw before, let's go find the account that is relevant here for our specific uh, uh, operation. So we have our tenant ID in this case is equal to the tenant ID that we pulled out of Redshift. And if we found that tenant ID, we found that account in Dynamics, let's update it with the new product usage data. If we didn't find that, we could have a requirement around actually creating the account if we wanted to. Maybe your data warehouse is your system of record, uh, and that's how customers are introduced to your ecosystem at first. So we'd have the ability to create an account within Dynamics as well if we wanted to. Regardless, uh, whatever um, you know, we, action we decide to take, let's send a message, as we saw before, to that relevant account. This would look very similar where we'd have our, um, our uh, channel that we have selected there, 
find all the fields that we want to pull in, count name, any other contextual data, and then we could add in buttons and things for the account team to interact with. The very last step of this workflow is to set the last time this ran. So making this workflow look only back as far as it needs to. Um, again, going around the really the automated aspect of this workflow where um, we want to have a look back window that's dynamic. Um, you know, maybe if we run it every day, we want to only look back, um, you know, the, the 24 hours period that, uh, that we picked up from, uh, from before. So I want to save time for any questions um, that you have around this use case or tray in general. I'm excited to answer those.